Good evening, everyone, and, and welcome to the Edinburgh Napier University MBA webinar. My name is Helen Sferopoulos. I'm the admissions manager at Stafford Global. And joining me this evening all the way from the UK is Dr. Kiran. Uh, good evening to you, Dr. Kiran. Good evening, Helen. How are you? I'm, I'm okay, thank you. And uh, I can see that we have quite a few of you that have joined us as far afield um, as Africa, which is excellent. And um, how we are going to conduct the webinar this evening is I'm just briefly going to introduce you to Stafford, who we are, and then I'm going to hand you over to Dr. Kiran, who's going to take you through the program. And then at the end of the presentation, you have the opportunity to ask us any questions. Um, if it's pertaining to the academics, uh, Dr. Kiran will be the perfect person to answer those. If it's pertaining to admissions, I can actually answer of those as well. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, who is Stafford Global? Well, Stafford Global um, uh, was established in 1993 and we are a resource centre for distance learning education. And we are a partner of six UK universities, one of which is Edinburgh Napier University. Now, our function is to assist you throughout the application process and ensure that you get that very, very important and Additional um, offer. Now we do offer a variety of programs um, ranging from MBAs, MECs, doctorates, um, and we have certificates and postgraduate diplomas. So we really do have quite a lot of um, programs for your personal and your professional needs. Okay, so I'm now going to hand you over to Dr. Kiran, who's going to take you through the program, and I'll join you towards the end of the presentation. Over to you. Thanks, Helen, and uh, good evening, everyone, or good afternoon, if you're uh, nearer my time zone, and it's great to talk to you today. Uh, as Helen said, my name is Dr. Kieran McFadden Young, and I am the program leader of the program suite of the MBA online program. So uh, as we'll see, there's a couple of different routes, and I'm the program uh, leader for those. Um, so we'll jump right in, and I'll tell you first about a little bit about Edinburgh, and then we'll talk about Edinburgh Napier. Uh, and why it makes a good, it's a good decision to join us here at Edinburgh Napier and our rankings. And then I'll talk a little bit more about the program, the different routes, the modules, and of course the assessments and how we fit those in or how you will fit those in with your day-to-day -day work, which is one of the aims of our program. So obviously, if you have any questions, then we will obviously cover okay. those at the end. Um, and uh, I'll be delighted to help you with any of those questions. Let me just go ahead. So Edinburgh has been voted uh, the best UK city for the past two years. I've lived there for uh, four years in total and I've just recently moved out and I actually do quite miss it a lot. It is a really great city if any of you get the chance to visit. Um, home to more tech startups and a lot of financial companies um, than London. And it's also home to one of the largest arts festivals in the world, if not the largest, because it has the arts festival, the Edinburgh festival, but also has this uh, what was called like a side festival or some of you might know it as the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Um, if any of you uh, know about UK comedians or even American comedians, a lot of those will have come to Edinburgh during August uh, to the Fringe Festival, which is a comedy festival. And so for the whole month of August, the entire city is completely uh, filled with tourists and stuff like that. So if you're into, into comedy, then I would say visit in August, but otherwise maybe, maybe come at a different time because it, you will be charged a lot for your hotel rooms. But it really is a nice city to, to live and obviously to work in as well. In terms of Edinburgh Napier, we have almost 20,000 students from more than 130 countries. And we're really proud to be an international campus, having that diversity of perspectives, diversity of backgrounds from all over the world really helps us and enriches our day-to-day -day experience. And um, obviously the conversations we have in class as well and getting that diversity of perspective. We have uh, about uh, two thirds of those are studying on campus in Edinburgh. We have three campuses across Edinburgh um, and we have 6,000 students studying at partner universities uh, worldwide and obviously online like the MBA Global Online. So our partner universities, we have universities in Hong Kong and Singapore. We have a campus in, I believe in Miami. Um, I have, uh, for example, doctoral students in Barbados and Jamaica. So we're really all, all around the world. Um, and for example, in places like Hong Kong, we're one of the largest UK providers of education in Hong Kong. So we are used to uh, to, to working with uh, people from all around the world. We are not a, a kind of a UK based university in the sense of our perspective. We are global in our perspective and in our outreach. 
So let me tell you about the views on Edinburgh Napier. Obviously, I'm going to tell you that it's a great place to, to come and study, but what have other people said? Well, it's a number one million plus modern university for business management, top five UK modern university for accounting and finance, top 10 for marketing, um, a top 10 for business. It's a top ranked Scottish modern university in the Times and Sunday Times Good University Guide. That's a, a more newer universities were the top ranked in Scotland. Uh, in the 2019 National Student Survey, uh, the HRM, such a group, the Human Resource Management Group, to which I belong, they received 100% student satisfaction in this survey, which is a survey of all the students in the UK. And that then placed us as number one in the UK out of all institutions, uh, further education institutions, universities offering human resource management. So you'll see across the different subject areas, accounting and finance, marketing, general business and human resource management, uh, no matter what you're interested in, we do have expert, experts in those areas and obviously are really well ranked in those areas too. So we have five QS stars for teaching, um, but also for employability and, like I said, internationalization, taking that international outlook. Uh, but employability is obviously a really important uh, factor in why people choose to do um, an MBA and to further progress their education. Um, and so we are really glad to say that we uh, employability is one of our key focuses for our teaching and for um, our student experience. Uh, we are uh, our, our motto is that it's a business school for employability, enterprise and empowerment. Uh, so we will um, have career focused skills. Uh, development within the MBA as well and throughout the in-class conversations we will deal with you as if you are going into the workforce as many of you will be uh, and the decisions um, that you will be making as managers and future managers there. We're top 10 in the UK for graduate employability again employability we have a HR excellence in research award from the European Commission and overall in our 2019 national student survey we reached a really good score of 84 percent student satisfaction overall which was um, really um, uh, shows the improvement over over a improvement trajectory over a good couple of years so uh, I think we'll be even more than that uh, in, in more recent surveys hopefully this year's survey. So those are the views on Edinburgh Napier and I've told you Edinburgh is always a great place to, to come visit if you ever get a chance. Uh, Edinburgh Napier as well I should say you can um, of course come visit the campus. Obviously this is an online program uh, and you wouldn't be able to choose um, an offline version of the module or an in-person version of the module but if you did want to come see the campus or even just come along for a cup of tea or coffee if you happen to be in Edinburgh then please just drop me an email and I'd be happy to, to do that and to show you around. We have a lovely campus and old buildings. Uh, we have to talk about this was the general route of the MBA first and then we will go on to the different routes of the MBA. Some of this you may know already but you might not know about the exact details and the exact breakdown of the structure. So I'll talk a little bit slower just so all the details are, are, are I have a tendency to talk very very fast um, so do tell me to slow down if you need to. So with the MBA general route, you will cover some general modules, a little bit of everything. And then obviously with the more specialized routes, you will specialize in a certain area. However, you will still get a taste of everything there. The main um, way in which you specialize uh, according to your MBA uh, route is these two modules in blue, as well as your MBA product. So these modules in blue here, managing innovation and contemporary issues and strategic management, those are available only on the general MBA route. So you look at innovation and, and how you encourage and manage and lead innovation in the workplace, contemporary issues and strategic management, looking at uh, current things going on in terms of strategy in the organization that's updated um, uh, very, very quickly according to uh, what's going on in the news and in current events. So a bit of strategy, a bit of innovation, but you will have innovation and strategy within the other modules, for example, leading strategic decision making. So those are available on your general route. If you take a specialized route, let's say the MBA and HRM, you will have two other modules instead of those modules in blue. And I'll show you the different routes and those different modules that you can swap in uh, for, for a specialization. It's also important to say as well that the MBA project will be specialized according to your chosen route. So if you do, uh, for example, again, an MBA in H HRM, you would be expected to have your MBA project on a HRM topic or organizational behavior topic, such as, for example, employee resourcing, talent management, performance management, something like that. The same goes if you were to do something in, in finance or in marketing or something like that. That is how then you specialize it, because you'll see 
All these modules uh, until the MBA project are 20 credits and the MBA project is worth 40 credits. So you'll have those two modules that you swap out as well as the MBA project. That's 80 credits um, of, your, of your specialization out of the a total of 180 credits. You're very well specialized within a particular route. However, as I said, you will get chances to look at other things as well. So I'll quickly go through the core modules um, and then we'll talk about the research skills and the MBA project modules uh, and then we'll go on to the different routes. So the core modules, we have management and organizational change. No matter what organization or what specialization you have in your career, you will always be dealing with management or you'll always uh, have a chance to become a manager. Uh, and of course, we are treating you as future managers or current managers. Uh, and you'll also have organizational change no matter what organization you go into. Change really ironically is the only constant that you'll have within an organization. What does change mean? That could be downsizing, upsizing, that could be a merger or acquisition, that could be a change in the processes or the services or products that you provide. Um, it could be a change in, in, the, in the team and the structures of the team and uh, people within the organization. Change, as I said, is a constant. So the reason that we have a module on it is because it's a constant, but also people tend to sometimes resist change. They sometimes get comfortable with where they are in their organization and their role, and they might resist that as well. So uh, this module is about managing that resistance, managing an organizational change initiative, and acting as, as a leader in that uh, regard. The next module then is what we call a hybrid module. So these were originally two separate modules, a strategy module and a leadership module, and we combined them together because of some natural overlaps there. So leading strategic decision making obviously is about the strategy of the organization and the decision making involved in that, but also the leadership element of that too. So how can you as a leader choose the right uh, path, choose the right strategy, make the decisions within that strategy, but also convince and motivate uh, your people to come along with you? What's, what a good leader should do is to motivate people as well as to put in place that structure for that, for that uh, strategy. Marketing and, and building high performing organizations. Again, another hybrid module. We have marketing and we have entrepreneurship. So you'll see, even if you don't specialize in entrepreneurship or marketing or leadership uh, or HRM, you will, you will have a little bit of taste of everything. So first of all, we build a high performing organization. We build an organization that's our entrepreneurship. We build a high performing organization. What are the measures, the quality uh, metrics that we should build into the organization to make sure it is a high performing organization? And then how do we market that? How do we um, get involved in marketing that on a global scale? Um, so a bit of both, uh, both uh, topics within that module. Then we have global business economics and finance. So we'll be covering some macroeconomics there, as well as a little bit of microeconomics. So macroeconomics, looking at the economy of, of a country and internationally as a whole, um, as well as the, the global productivity and international uh, and national productivity, as well as a little bit of microeconomics as well, looking at the decisions that um, our employees and our customers uh, and potential customers will make, as well, of course, as finance, looking at different things like financial health of the organization, how competitive the organization is, um, how quickly it can um, overcome its debt obligations, how it can restructure debt, different financial decisions that you will make as a manager within uh, or a future manager within your organizations. I talked about managing innovation and contemporary issues, and we will look at the swaps, uh, uh, what modules you will swap in for those in a second. Then research skills for managers. So after you have finished all these uh, six modules, the six 20 credit modules, the core modules plus your two option modules, you will then, after you've done those, go on to research skills for managers, because we know that not a lot of people will have done a research project before. So we want to make sure that you are well equipped to go out and do a research project. Even if you have done one before, it is always useful to hone your skills when it comes to research skills, um, because there's always um, uh, contemporary issues to, to account for. For example, with the pandemic, how do we change um, our research approach according to a pandemic. So research skills for managers will teach you the core basics about how to carry out a research uh, project. Most of you will be aware of uh, research projects that are quantitative in, in, in nature. Uh, so things like surveys or um, a questionnaire, which you might have filled out before, that would be what we call a quantitative approach to research. And you will learn about that. You'll learn about statistical analysis. Once you've got that survey data back in, how do you analyze it? 
but you'll also learn about the other aspect of research, um, the other approach, which is the qualitative approach. And some of you, probably fewer of you, might have taken part in, for example, research interviews before or focus groups. If you're in marketing, you might have arranged a focus group. And those are mostly what we call a qualitative approach, where we care more about the, the depth of the data that we're getting rather than the frequency. Surveys, you can ask a lot. Uh, of people, some very small questions because they, you know, they're not going to give you more than five minutes of 10 minutes of their time. Qualitative research is more about the depth of data. We ask someone, someone a lot of questions and we get very much uh, deep into uh, their thoughts, their opinions and their perceptions. So depending on what you want to study in your research project, you would take a different approach. Okay, Sometimes you could take a mixed method approach, but we usually say take either a quantitative or a qualitative approach, depending on what the topic is. So if you're marketing, you would probably go along the focus group route or maybe the interview route. Uh, if, for example, you wanted to look at, at economics or finance, you might look at a survey um, or using a secondary data there, a quantitative approach. We will teach you all that, how to do these different approaches as well as how to justify your approach and how to match your approach to the particular topic of your project. I should say as well, before we talk about the embedded project module, Whatever it is you're interested in, and, and that could be a business problem that you want to uh, you want to approach, um, or something that you want to solve for your company, for your organization, or just something that you're really interested in, some topic that you're really interested in, we will work with you to develop a really uh, well-grounded proposal that you can then bring to your MBA project. So the proposal is the assessment for your research skills for manager module. And then that makes up the, the part um, of the MBA project because that's the first step towards finishing your MBA project, choosing a topic that is relevant, that is interesting to you, which I think is the one, obviously the most important thing, um, and can add value to your career, either through your future career endeavors or for your um, current organization. If, for example, maybe they're sponsoring you or they think actually here, if somebody knew about this, then there could be a job for them or a promotion for you or something like that. So think about your own organization. Are there any problems that they maybe want to have solved? Is there something that they just don't have time to look at and they need somebody to look at? Or is there something that you're really interested in in, in the academic literature or something that's just keeping you up at night in terms of a research question? So you can have that for your MBA project. I always tell my dissertation students, pick something that you're really passionate and interested in about, because the MBA project, you can take one trimester or you can take two trimesters to complete it. So you will, will be looking at this stuff quite a lot. Um, and so it's really important that you're interested in that. MBA project, you'll go out, collect data or use secondary data um, that's already been collected and you will analyze that and then you will uh, come up with findings and then uh, importantly, recommendations for organizations. You'll write that up into a, a dissertation. And of course, you will have a supervisor who's a member of staff here at Edinburgh Napier University or our partner institutions who will help you with, with that, um, that write-up, who will help you to analyze the results and ask you questions about those findings, prompt your, your thinking and um, really point, they'll be expert, they'll, they will have expertise uh, in your topic. Um, so they will point you towards certain literature uh, and help you along that process. So you won't be doing it alone. Um, we, you will have that preparation with your research skills for managers module, as well as your supervisor there at, at, um, at the end of, of an email. Uh, quickly, before I go on to the roots, I'll talk to you about the exit points. We hope that you will stay with us for the whole MBA project. However, we do know that life happens and we are aware of that. Uh, and that's been built into the design of this project or sorry, of this, uh, of this uh, program. Um, so there are different exit points um, throughout the program if you don't want to graduate with an entire MBA. If you complete all the, the modules um, that are here, all these uh, six uh, 20 credit modules plus your research skills for managers modules, which is also 20 credits, plus your MBA project, you will graduate with uh, an MBA in total. So it is the research skills for managers module and the MBA project that makes it the MBA. That's 180 credits. If, for example, though, you finished all of your 20 credit modules and you didn't want to do the MBA project or some circumstances have arisen that made it impossible for you to, to do the MBA project, you could then exit with 120 credits, which would be a postgraduate diploma. If you did three modules, so three 20 credit modules and you had 60 credits, you would exit with a postgraduate certificate. And then if you got fewer than that, all the individual modules carry an award as well. So you are still, if you finish these modules, you're still able to show your employers 
um, I would be good in this role because I have, for example, completed a module on global business economics and finance at an MBA level, which is very attractive for employers. But obviously, we hope you, we would have you with us for the entire MBA. So as I said, we will we can swap out the different routes. Uh, uh, we can swap out the different modules according to the different routes. So in blue here, managing innovation, contemporary issues, and strategic management, only available for the general route. If, for example, you wanted to do the MBA in banking up there, um, then you would study global finance and financial markets, institutions, and banking, along again, along with these core modules here. So the core modules common to all the routes. The blue modules are where you would swap out. Okay, so hopefully that's clear, but if, if not, then please ask us at the end. Uh, you'll see all the different routes available to you, really able to customize according to your career or your intended career. For example, if you wanted to move into a HRM role, you could then study the HRM specialist route. So you would graduate with an MBA um, um, with, a, with a HRM specialism there, uh, as well as having that project uh, on top of that, which could be targeted towards your organization if you wanted it to be. Uh, so all the different routes available to you um, across um, a, a variety of different uh, expertise and different disciplines and we have supervisors who will work with you on your projects who have expertise in all of those. For example, I told you how the, the, uh, the Edinburgh Fringe Festival and the Arts Festivals huge festivals across the world, uh, even in, on an international stage. We have people who work in those festivals or her, who consult on these festivals. So for example, hospitality and tourism management, we will have people with real life experience of working on these events as well. So a lot of different routes available. Let me then tell you about the global online programs in general and how they work. So they were 100% online. That means we there's no expectation and uh, for you to come to campus or to uh, to to be present in Edinburgh at any time. As I said, you're always welcome to come along for a visit if you want, though. They're also 100% asynchronous or about 90% asynchronous. Asynchronous means um, that the the student and uh, the uh, the lecturer are not uh, in the room at the same time. They're not in the same virtual classroom at the same time. So synchronous learning is our usual kind of classroom-based learning where you would have somebody at the top of the classroom uh, and then you would have students um, learning at the same time as the, the, the lecturer or the teacher is, is teaching or lecturing. Asynchronous is different. The lecturer basically will upload their lecture materials as well as recorded lectures um, and additional study materials. Um, and then you will learn that in your own time. Okay, so that's why we mean it's asynchronous. You're not in the same virtual space at the same time. For that, with that in mind, that means it's very flexible because the, the lecturer doesn't have to be there at the same time as you are there. That means you can study at a time, a place, and a pace that suits your own personal demands, your own style of learning, as well as your own professional demands. This course is designed, this program is designed with the someone who is working full-time or, or part-time um, in mind. So that is, a, you know, it is not designed with someone who is a traditional student who has no other obligations. We know that you will have other obligations. They could be professional as well as personal, like caring responsibilities. Uh, and so that's, that's why the, the design is uh, as it is. We have high quality materials, they're engaging, they're interactive, and they're self-directed. Uh, you will have some, uh, as you'll see, you'll have some end of unit tests to test your progress uh, as you go along, which is really useful for those of us like me, um, who like to have some kind of test at the end of, uh, of learning each different uh, module or diff different aspect of the module. So they're also engaging, and, and as I said, they're interactive. As I said, it's truly international student experience. We have students from all around the world from um, more than 130 countries, I think now, um, really adding to that diversity uh, of, of perspective and background that uh, enriches, I think, the learning experience. We have three intakes per year, the January uh, intake, uh, the May intake, which is hopefully the one you're thinking about right now, and the September intake, if you need a, a couple of more uh, weeks or, or months to decide uh, or to get finances in order, we do have a September intake. So three intakes per year, pretty flexible flexible in terms of when you want to join too. So I'll talk briefly about assessments and the assessments will look different um, according to what module you are studying. However, they will have usually this common structure in place. I know assessments are sometimes um, 
uh, something that people like to think about very much so before they start a course of study because they think, will I be able to keep up with the assessments with my caring demands, my caring responsibilities or my professional demands, my work projects, things like that. So again, it's designed with the person who is working full or part time or has caring responsibilities full or part time in mind. So you'll be provided with both formative feedback and summative assessments throughout your um, MBA degree. Formative feedback, just to use a kind of pedagogical te terminology here, formative feedback means we will give you constructive um, improvement-based feedback. Usually that will be uh, orally through a voice clip or a conversation with your lecturer or, or your tutor, um, or it could just be written on your essays as well. So formative feedback um, will allow you to improve and develop your critical analysis skills, your academic writing skills, your presentation skills, things like that. And it's very much about improving uh, the learner's experience and improving uh, the learner's outputs in terms of academic outputs for future assessments. So you will never just be provided just with a grade, like an A, B, C, or a, you know um, what we use, a P1, a P2. Um, you will never just be given that. You will also be given formative feedback on how to improve for future assessments, uh, as well as saying what you did right and what you did well. Um, in this assessment. So we do take um, a blended approach or, a, or a, a nuanced approach there to that formative feedback. You will then also have the summative assessments. That's the, the grade-based assessments that you're probably more familiar with, where you will be given um, a particular grade at the end of your module. So how do the assessments work? Well, in each module, remember we have uh, six modules, um, core, uh, four core and two option modules. And then you will have your uh, your research skills for manager module and your project module. I'm talking here just about those six core mod core modules and option modules um, because the other two are different assessments. So for most of your modules, you will have an end of unit progress test. That's ten academic units with online questions at the end of each unit. So when you're studying the different, uh, for example, leading to strategic decision making, you will have you know a little module, kind of sub module or a little what we call a unit, where you will cover the basics of, for example, strategy. What does a good strategy look like? How can you make a good strategy? Um, what are the different tools you can use to ensure that your strategy is is well prepared and is thinking of, for example, threats and opportunities, things like that. After you've completed that unit, which comprises a unit, after you've completed that unit, you will have um, questions. So, so multiple choice questions where you can then test your knowledge. So that is counted as an assessment because it does count as 10% of the final module mark per module. Um, all of these units count as, 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 as uh, go, toward, go towards a 10% of your final module mark. However, it also, I think, just helps you to, to test where you are and to test what you might need to look at a bit more, which I think is useful for when you're learning in an asynchronous environment and you're learning at your own pace. You'll be able to see how effective your own pace um, and strategy, pardon the bun, is. Uh, so that will test your knowledge and understanding of the key concepts. Then you will have an end of module assessment. And by end of module assessment, I mean week 13 of most modules. There are some modules where you'll have um, an assessment in, in the middle, uh, which we are just trialing right now. But for most of your modules, you'll have an end of module assessment. Well, you'll have uh, on week 13, you will have to provide some type of assessment. Again, depending on what module you're doing, that will differ from module to module. So for leading strategic decision making, you might have an academic essay. For your economic, economics and finance modules, you might have maybe a financial analysis or a more economic based essay um, or report. So there'll be different types of assessment um, depending on what you study. However, that is then useful because that provides you with a range of different ways of, 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 of uh, assessing, um, uh, assessing the literature, for example, and coming up with different arguments and approaches. So that's worth 90% of your overall module grade. So you can see with that 10% from your end of unit progress test, um, most of that is going, for, uh, most of the, your module grade is coming from that end of module assessment. So it's the end of module, it's very much, um, you know, uh, something to, to prepare throughout the different module uh, or throughout the course of the module because we know that you'll be working full time or part time and you will have maybe caring responsibilities as well. Assessments are going to be taken under uh, undertaking online and they will be described in the approved module descriptors. If there's a module that you think actually I might be interested in that, 
but I wonder what the module assessment looks like, you can look that up on the Edinburgh Napier website. Just take the module code and, and look it up, or even just, just Google it with Edinburgh Napier University. You'll find the module descriptor if you need more information on that. Uh, and you might also see that we don't have any exams. So the assessment is 100% through continu what we call continuous assessment. And that's assessments like your, your end of module assessment and your end of unit progress test. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more later about uh, why we don't have exams, if, if anyone wants to know. Um, but we also know as well that exams don't necessarily work for people who have uh, full-time, part-time uh, roles in their organizations or have caring responsibilities. So that is one of the reasons. Um, and in terms of quality process, uh, we have a quality assurance process. We will, uh, as module leaders, we'll sample a number of the summative assessments and we'll just check that the work submitted undertaken is that of the matriculated student. We also have a software that you might be familiar with called Turnitin, which uh, basically works as a plagiarism checker. Plagiarism is where you um, take somebody else's work and, and pass it off as your own. Obviously, then, if that happened, you know, you wouldn't be awarded that module, um, that module outcome or that module pass, and it would have very serious implications. So we do have these checks and, pro and, and processes in place to make sure that that doesn't happen. If, for example, there was a question about the, the authenticity of, of your work, you might be asked to have um, what's called a, a, a viva or basically an oral assessment, a conversation with the lecturer to ensure that this is your work. Um, that doesn't really happen in, in, in practice because we have quite stringent processes in place and because everyone's aware of those processes, but just to mention them now so you are aware of those. So let's look at the uh, trimester and the module outlines. This starts in January, but if you just skip ahead and imagine that we're starting in May for anyone who's applying to start in May. Um, so you will have, you'll start your first trimester and you will have two modules per trimester. So that's two of your 20 credit modules. Uh, and really you can choose whatever kind of, you know, uh, structure of modules that you want. However, you just have to have those 20 credit modules at the start. And then you have to have completed those 20 credit modules before you can go on to the research skills for managers and the project, uh, the project module. So what we call the project modules, they have to be the last ones that you would you would do. And then you can see that uh, reflected here. So trimester one, module one, module two, trimester two, module three, module four, trimester three, module five, module six. Then you would have one trimester dedicated to research skills for manager. And then you would have at least one trimester and some do take two trimesters to look at their MBA project. So we will work with you to decide what is the best approach according again to your own your own personal and professional needs there. Uh, but you could finish that within within those um, those five trimesters if you were were really keen to get get it um, finished uh, by then. In terms of the module outline and what it looks like within each module, in week one, you will have access to the module materials on our virtual learning environment. We use a virtual learning environment called Moodle, which some of you might be familiar with from maybe previous programs that you might have done. Uh, Blackboard is another uh, alternative and they're very, they're very similar. So we have all these uh, materials available in week one on Moodle. Uh, we also have an online induction where you'll be talking to, to either myself or somebody else, uh, and you will have um, resources there with your induction to teach you about, for example, accessing the, the library online or um, academic writing skills, something like that, to ensure that you are comfortable, you feel uh, able to access the, all the different materials that you need to use in the library, journals, um, textbooks, uh, academic books, things like that, as well as that you're comfortable with the academic skills that you need as well, such as writing an essay versus writing a report. Um, we will have that all available to you, so don't worry that if you don't um, if you don't know about that, or maybe it's been a while since you since you uh, finished a, a previous program, or if you haven't finished a previous program, as, as some of our students haven't, we will teach you all about that. You will commence your studies then in week one, week one um, going on from week two to week 12. You'll just be studying again on your own time, in your own personal pace and place, and as, as, as uh, demands um, from your personal life and professional life will, will allow. Week 13 then is the submission of your final assignment. As I said, we have about, I believe, two modules. Uh, leading strategic decision making is one of those where you would actually have um, one big assignment, but it's split into two. So you would submit the first half within the, the, the midpoint of the trimester. I believe that's about week seven, week eight. And then you'd have the second half of that assignment due in week 13. However, they are in the minority. Most of your modules, you will submit your final assessment in week 13. 
Uh, of course, then that's worth 90%. And as you're going along with your module study throughout the trimester, you will do those end of progress unit tests to give you that extra 10%, which is not to be sniffed out when it comes to actually, um, when it comes to your final grade. So uh, briefly to talk about the entry requirements and fees, that's what the structure of the program looks like in the different routes. Um, and Helen obviously will, will help me in talking about the entry requirements and fees if you have any further questions on what's on this slide. Um, but honours degree at 2.2 or above plus two years relevant work experience is kind of the default entry requirements that you would need. So an honours degree, 2.2 or above, um, but also having that two years relevant work experience. And it would be up to you, I suppose, and, and your conversation with your staff or global consultant to, to work out what is what would be considered relevant work experience with the particular route, for example, that you're going for. However, that is the default kind of qualifications. However, we do know that people come from a variety of different backgrounds, work backgrounds, professional and, and personal backgrounds. So we could also allow comparable alternative qualifications or professional qualifications qualifications as well as relevant work experience uh, to be considered in your in your entry requirement. So for example, if you don't have that honours degree at 2.2 or above, maybe you finished um, a diploma or certificate, but you have something like eight, 10 years work experience, well then we know that you are capable of undertaking an MBA degree. So we will definitely have that conversation with you. So the first point of call there is your staff or global personal consultant. They will then liaise with me um, about making that decision about whether you would be eligible for entry into the program. The alternative to the MBA for those without relevant work experience, so for example, you have your honours degree at 2.2 or above, but you just haven't gone into the workplace yet, um, and you want to continue on studying before you go into the workplace, we also have the MSc Business Management, which is um, a lot of similar uh, modules taking um, a slightly different approach in terms of the assessment and what, what is required. Um, there's September and January starts for that, if you um, are thinking about maybe um, that as an alternative. If your first language isn't English, and of course a lot of our students, their, their first language is not English, you need to provide evidence demonstrating that, that you can conduct yourself in English within this MBA program. Um, for example, a previous degree in English or the results of a particular English language test. Again, talk to your staff or global personal consultant about that. It's important, I suppose, that there is a standard of English because we do expect a certain standard of, for example, critical analysis within your essays um, and, and uh, within your reports and especially within your dissertation, your MBA project. So it is important that, that, that there is that, that standard of English. Um, uh, and of course, we will have a conversation with you about that and about making you uh, maybe uh, talking to you about that as well. So in terms of the immediate deadline, so for those of you who are interested in starting in May, that's the 30th of May is our program start, well then you would need to have your application in with Stafford Global by the 20th of May. Um, so you have a little bit of time yet, and of course uh, Stafford Global and myself are on hand if you have any additional questions uh, before you uh, submit your application. And in terms of your fees, you would talk to Stafford Global about those fees um, and, um, and, and that fee structure that you'd have in place, okay? So I think that's everything. This is, uh, I suppose, the, the one thing to, to note is this is the final point of, of your degree, which is your graduation. And of course, um, anyone from a, who graduates from a, a Napier degree, whether that's a global online degree or in person, is invited to come along to, this is Usher Hall in the middle of Edinburgh, the city centre, uh, and graduate in person. We'd be del delighted to see you if you could come to your graduation, but of course you can graduate in abstentia as well. Um, but just to point out, this is your final point, and uh, think of what a good feeling that will be when you can uh, add the, the letters MBA after your name. So I'll turn back to Helen, and if you have any questions, please feel free um, to, to ask them now, or of course to drop me an email. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Kieran. That was very, very informative. And uh, I have been looking at the questions in the background whilst you were doing the presentation, and there's quite a lot of them, so I have actually grouped them uh, together. Okay, so do listen out for your question and your answer. Okay, so the first one was a very interesting um, a question that comes from Ismail. Um, is there value to completing a postgraduate diploma as opposed to doing the full MBA program? 
I would, well, I think there definitely would be value in doing a diploma. Um, again, I suppose depending on your own individual circumstances and the career that you are aspiring to do, there would be value in completing um, a certain modules because, uh, again, depending on your circumstances, they might be useful within a certain career route um, that you can say, well, I've looked at leading strategic decision making, I've done a module on management and organizational change. Therefore, I am a good person to choose for this promotion that's going to look at leading an organizational change, for example. So that, I think that would be more circumstance dependent. Um, and I think there will, you know, there is a combination of modules there that would suit kind of most circumstances. Um, if you wanted your diploma, um, I think that would be that would be useful to you. Uh, I suppose the addition, uh, the additional um, uh, value that an MBA project uh, gives you is that you're showing your employer and potential employers that you are able to carry out a research project, you're able to go collect data um, and you're able to analyze that data with a critical mindset that you're able to really critically analyze that data and come up with interesting findings but also useful findings in, in, in the way of recommendations for your organization or for other organizations or any organizations in your industry. And that's always going to be useful no matter what field you're in, because at some point you're going to have to go look to your stakeholders and that could be your customers or your clients or your um, employees. You're going to have to get their input and their feedback and you're going to have to come up with recommendations and findings that the organization will then that, that, that will then use. That's all kind of part of management and especially senior management. So if you have that MBA project, you're showing that actually I can do this and here here is a nice project that shows that I have these skills. And that's for any project you do. An additional, I suppose, consideration is, is with regards to the MBA project is, like I said, if there is a particular uh, problem or issue that your organization wants to look at. And it could be a problem in terms of we need to solve this quite, quite immediately, or it could be maybe an opportunity. So if we move into this customer segment, if we move into this uh, market in a different country, what would that look like? What would we need to take on board? So you could, again, according to your own specific circumstances, you could have a particular issue that your organization wants to solve and you can shape your MBA project around that particular issue. So again, depending on the circumstances, I would say always say go with what you're most interested in. Um, but even if you do something that's not completely related to your organization, you would still be able to show your organization, I have these hard and soft skills, analytical skills, data collection skills, recommendation making skills that make me um, a, a more strategic thinker. Um, in terms of uh, going for management and senior management positions. So uh, I think there's value, again, depending on your own circumstances, and we try to be as flexible as possible because we know people have different circumstances. Um, an additional point, just to, and we'll, I, I, I'm guessing we will probably touch on this later um, with other questions, is if you do have the postgraduate diploma, um, you could, you know, you could enter in with the expectation that you're just going to do the diploma but then you could move on to the project you know we, you can only have one award but um we are flexible in terms of you know just because you've said you're just going to study a certificate or a diploma doesn't mean you can't change your mind later on and say actually i want to go for the whole mba so you know that is a little um you know you can be cautious in your approach with that Okay, hey, good. Um, I hope that actually answered your question, Ismail. It's a very, very good answer. Thank you so much, Dr. Kiran. Okay, and um, a question from Musa. Is it really mandatory to do the MBA project or is it optional? So if you wanted to graduate with an MBA, you would have to do the project. And um, to do the project, you also have to do the research skills for manager module. So you wouldn't be able to graduate from an MBA, from this MBA program without a project. That is pretty similar, I think, to most to most MBA, um, to most MBA degrees where you'd have to do some form of data collection and analysis and, and making findings and recommendations. Might not be couched as a project as such, but there would be some element of that in most MBAs, um, either as one discrete module or across a group of different modules. So we like our approach because I think by the time you get to the MBA project, you have looked at, you know, you have analyzed things and you've come up with different findings and arguments and recommendations within all the other modules already. However, those are more academic literature based where you're thinking more conceptually and in theory. Um, and actually by the time you, and you have those skills, by the time you get to the MBA project, then you can go out into the world and collect real primary data um, from your customers, your clients, your your friends, or your, your family, and, and 
and, and then put that to use. So it's kind of a more uh, risk averse approach, I think, and it suits people because they feel like they're not being thrown into, into real world data collection uh, as quickly. So it isn't, um, it isn't option, it, it, is, it is compulsory that you, that you do the MBA project if you wanted to uh, graduate with an MBA degree. However, as we saw, there are different exit points if you didn't want to do that. Good, and um, there's quite a few that have asked the duration of the MBA. Can I stretch it to two to three years or even four years? What is the maximum time frame? So that's a good question because we do, again, aware, we're aware of people's different personal professional circumstances. We do have students who take what, what are called suspended studies. Uh, I believe that's a maximum of two trimesters and in very, very uh, 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 extenuating circumstances, it might be three trimesters, but you can suspend your studies for um, at least two trimesters, um, or sorry, at least one trimester and up to two, and at certain times, three trimesters. And that's where maybe something has happened in your personal or professional life. Um, maybe you suddenly have additional caring responsibilities. You have a sick relative or a sick child or something like that. We know things like that happen and um, you can therefore stretch it, uh, to, to use your words, you can stretch the degree over a couple of years um, in terms of suspended studies. So you take a trimester or two trimesters out where you don't study anything. Again, you'd have to have a conversation with myself and our global online um, support team. Um, however, in some other circumstances as well, you might take a one module per trimester approach as well, which would stretch it out quite a lot, or you could do maybe one module uh, for one trimester and then two modules for the next trimester. Uh, we don't recommend that you do any more than two modules per trimester, but you can certainly drop down to one if you think, actually, I'm going to have a huge work project on from you know the January trimester to, to, to May. I might just do one module for that trimester. So you can stretch it out somewhat. There is a bit of flexibility in there within certain confines. Have it suspensions, suspension of studies if you have extenuating circumstances, or if you wanted to drop down to one module, you could do that as well. Good, excellent. Um, and Jeff, uh, could you just um, provide me more details um, about your question? I'm not quite understanding um, what you're asking. So if you can just type out um, more information on that, then uh, myself or Dr. Kiran can actually assist you. Okay, so a question from Aisha. Do I really have to do an IELTS examination? Okay, very good question. Um, I'll be able to answer that uh, quickly for you. Please do get in touch with us, um, with your personal academic consultant. There are various methods of actually meeting the English requirement. And we would like to have a chat to you. We'd also like to actually look at your degree certificate, your CV. That really does play quite a big role. So please do get in touch with us and we'll be able to assist you with that as well. Okay, so a question from Mohammed. Um, I have been informed that you are going to be doing the ACSB accreditation. My question is, will this create any changes in my assessments or entry criteria? Very good question. Yeah, absolutely, Mama. That, that, that's a great question. So in terms of the assessments and entry, well, let me go back to, and then say that we've been preparing for our AACSB accreditation. Um, it is a, quite a long process in terms of, of what we have to do for prep, as well as our own assessment um, in terms of, of, of the people from the ACSB headquarters coming out and assessing us. So there is a kind of a long process. This hasn't been done over a year. It's been more like five years. So uh, what we have in place for now, I, I, I don't envisage that would be changing because um, it's certainly something that has, a, in our view, already would meet the requirements of, of AACSB. Uh, and oftentimes they wouldn't look at things as, as um, at that level of granular detail. So I don't think things will change in terms of um, your experience on this on this degree in terms of the entry requirements or in terms of the assessments. Um, usually what would happen is um, if there, there might be a change in the assessment, for example, because we wanted to change the case study or because we wanted to, to look at a different aspect or to reflect added material or something like that, but you will be communicated with that um, qu quite quickly and in, in, in good time. And so it shouldn't really affect your, your experience on, on the, the MBA. Um, in terms of the ACSB, I don't think they would make um, 
you know that wouldn't be an uh, affect those um level of details so much um because we think we're kind of already operating at that at that level um we're just waiting now um for next year to to uh in, in our next academic year um i believe we will then be having our visit from the aacsb people from from florida um and they will come and give us the, their final assessment as we go for that accreditation so um most of the changes that are required are on the lecturers and the administrator sides not on the student side so i wouldn't worry too much about that Excellent. And Imra's question um, is something that is probably a lot of, I'm sure a lot of students have actually asked you this. Um, I am actually quite worried about the finance module. I have not done finance before. Is this difficult? Can I pass it? So I'm uh, probably in a similar situation, or I was in a similar situation when I did my master's, where, where I had to do an economics and finance module. And if you ask anybody, they will tell they, they will tell you that I am not someone who is good with numbers or good with stuff like finance. Um, I'm getting a bit better at economics, but certainly finance is not in my skill set. Um, and the approach that my lecturers took at the time in a different institution is very similar to the approach that we would take. We are not assuming that you would have a heightened level of financial novel, uh, knowledge. Uh, and we would certainly put in place resources and we have in place resources for those who are new to finance um, and that, that could be um, in terms of recorded lectures that could be in terms of uh, the, the materials just written materials as well as additional links to to materials for those who are new to the the finance um, way of thinking and the and financial analysis for example so we wouldn't see that um, as you know if you if you if you haven't encountered financial analysis or anything like that before, then I wouldn't be worried because we are catering to you as well as those who are more experienced. There is going to be a range of materials there for you. should point out as well, and I haven't mentioned it, is that every week you will have a live academic session. Um, and those are not mandatory to, to, to come along to. You don't have to come to them if you don't want to. Um, and they are recorded as well if you want to watch them back afterwards. One of the one of the good things to come out of the pandemic is that we're more familiar now with recording things. Um, so the live academic session is where you would have a question and answers session with um, an academic. So our global on online tutors um, who I would manage, they would come along. So for example, in a finance module, you're not sure of a particular metric or a particular ratio. You don't know how to use it or how to apply it or what it means or why you should use it. Um, you can come along to one of these sessions and they are um, in place for every module. And you can ask the, the, the tutor um, who's in place uh, to give you more background information on that. And that acts like a question and answer session, but it, it allows you to really drill the tutor on, 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 on whatever questions you might have that might not be immediately obvious in the materials. I think we cover most things in the materials, but there could be something that you just need more clarification on. As well as the live academic sessions, which again, aren't mandatory, we also have an optional uh, uh, global online uh, support advisor, so the GOSA advisors, um, who will be available for anyone who wants to have a conversation, for example, about academic skills or maybe some things about materials. We have really experienced um, uh, MBA tutors and lecturers on hand and you can book a session with them. And it doesn't really matter where you are in the world because they will have availability all throughout the day. Um, so for example, if you're um, you know, ahead of GMT, then you know, they will have sessions available um, in, the, in the morning and vice versa if you're back in the, in the USA or, or in South America or Canada. So those are optional as well, but you can book an appointment for that with them, a half an hour appointment, for example, because you don't know maybe about referencing or you don't know about academic writing, things like that. So as well as having those kind of materials in place. I should also mention we also have those live sessions uh, in place as well if you need them. Again, they're not compulsory, they're not mandatory, you don't have to come along to them because it is 100% asynchronous, but if you want them they are there as well. So we do have a safety net for, for if you don't understand some of the, the written material. Okay. Excellent, excellent. And um, we do have a question from Miriam. I have completed a postgraduate certificate from an institution in America. Will you accept this as credits? So on that, and I suppose this really goes for everything that we're talking so far in terms of entry requirements, in terms of, for example, um, I think it was Aisha asked about the English language requirements. 
all of that we will have a conversation with you about and i think that's one of the most important things sometimes you see these requirements or you see these um particular uh you know regulations or something like that a lot of the time those can be met with having a conversation and looking at different aspects of you as an individual so what you have experienced in your life the different types of experiences you have so when it comes to something like uh some credit what we call credit exemptions if you have done for example a module on leadership and a module on strategy well then if i see that and i see the outcomes of that and i see that these outcomes are very similar to our one of our modules then i i know that you do not have to study leading strategic decision making for example which is a common one across a lot of mba programs so if you've done uh, for example a postgraduate diploma or certificate in another institution that looks at management you probably will have looked at leadership you probably will have looked at strategy in some regard so usually lsdm is what we would uh, would have a credit exemption for however other people will have exemptions for finance or economics so have a conversation with us um, and talk first to your staff or global uh, consultant provide them importantly to provide them with the learning outcomes of that program so if for example you have um, you know your program handbook from that previous program that you did or your module guides or something like that it's important for us then to look at the learning outcomes from each of those program guides or module guides and then match it or try to match it with what we have on our program. If we can match it to a certain level, then we would give you a credit exemption, meaning you wouldn't have to study that particular module um, as part of your MBA degree. So have a conversation with us first. If there's anything you're not sure about, just come to us and we'll always be at the other end of the email. Absolutely. Do get in touch with your Stafford uh, Global Consultant so we'll be able to guide you as to what documents Dr. Kiran and his team really do require for those exemptions. Um, and a question from Abdullah. Can I actually change my MBA speciality during my studies? Yeah, so this is a good question, and this is something. I, first of all, I say yes. It would depend on where you are in the in the particular program, but I would say most of the time yes. Um, and that is something uh, that I do get a few requests, uh, maybe every week or well, maybe every month at least, uh, for someone who has maybe started off in the marketing route and now wants to move into the HRM route or something like that because they have studied some topics or something has happened in the organization and they think actually I want I want to move into this route. So we would say probably the best approach to take and you don't have to do this approach but we usually say that probably the best approach to take is to do to do those four core modules so the, the modules the ones that weren't in blue the ones on top of that do those first and get a feel for the different topics and the different uh, the different uh, aspects of it you might suddenly uh, you know you might look at the the program guide and um, and see the modules that you were going to do under a certain speciality and think actually I'm not really that interested in that anymore or maybe my priorities have changed Maybe you've studied something on your core modules that made you think, actually, I want to look at this a lot, um, which is something that happened to me during my master's. Uh, at that point, then you can just email the, uh, the, the administration team and the support team. They're called the Global Online Support Team uh, and have uh, just basically write a, a small letter, a small uh, uh, justification for why you want to change your route. Usually that is no issue. Usually I would approve those right away because I know people's tastes and, and, and goals change over time. When it gets, where it gets difficult is, for example, if you've already completed one of your, your specialist modules. So one of those modules in blue that you swapped out um, from, the, from the general route, if you've already completed one of those, it might then be more difficult to, to, to swap to another route. You can usually then just do the additional two modules, but that obviously then you'd be paying for an extra module. So I would say go for the four core modules first uh, and then really have a really good long think about what you want to study uh, and then make those decisions before you choose your optional modules. Um, if you've already done those optional modules, then you're almost kind of locked into that route, I would say. So at that point, it would be probably too late to change. So in most cases, yes. And I think by the time you've completed the four modules, you have a definite understanding of what you want to do. So for most students, it's very simple. Uh, it's a very simple process. Just make that decision, um, you know, uh, after doing those four core modules, I would recommend. So usually no problem. Okay, and um, this actually leads to another question that is actually quite popular. It does come up quite uh, quite a bit. I have noticed that the um, subjects are really similar across all the specialisations. So can I do two specialisms? Um, is that permitted? Very so 
Yeah, absolutely. And I can see why, but unfortunately not. Um, just be, the way that the structure of the program works is that you only be able to choose one specialism because if you think it's not just about the modules that specialize your MBA degree, it's also your MBA project. And so once you go into an MBA project, once you do a piece of research that's, that's lasting quite a bit, at the end of it, you're actually kind of like an expert on, on the topic that you've looked at. It could be a very, very small, very specific topic, but you are, you know, a world expert on this, so hopefully by the by the end of this this, this project. So uh, the specialism comes not only from the modules that you choose, but also the project. And as I said, if you're doing a marketing project, a marketing route, if you're taking a marketing route, you'd have to do a marketing project um, because that is part of that specialization. That's what gets you to that 80 credits out of the 180 credits, so almost half the credits specialized within a particular uh, within a particular route. So because of the structure of the program works like that, you wouldn't be able to do two specialisms, but I can see why you would want to. Okay, and Samantha's question is, um, I am planning on actually starting this MBA in May. That's fantastic, Samantha, excellent. But her question is, can I sometime during my studies actually shift to on-campus studies in the UK? So again, unfortunately not, um, because of the way that the structure of the programs work. So we have the, the MBA in person as well, but that is structured somewhat differently to the MBA online. And because you will have, um, because there are different structural aspects um, to the two programs, it wouldn't actually be possible to move from one to the other. Um, it is something, it is a question, as you said, that's a popular question. So it is something we're thinking of. Um, however, at the moment that wouldn't be, wouldn't be possible. Although, as I said, you know, you are welcome anytime on campus if you wanted to to, to come around, come and uh, look around, um, and also the library would be available to you as well. Uh, if you just give us um, some notice, we can then um, allow you to use the library. It's open during the day anyway, so you can always go in. Um, but for example, if you wanted to go in after hours, we could maybe um, have an, have a discussion about that. So the library is available to you. Um, on campus if you wanted to use that as well as on online um, like most people will be using but you wouldn't be able to actually join the other in-person program unfortunately okay and um, a very interesting question is i am planning on doing online studies because i cannot uh, leave my work in nigeria my question is will i be permitted to actually work um, and get a work visa in the UK for the two-year period after graduation? Um, I'm not entirely sure about that. That would be a different department than me that would deal with that. Maybe Helen, you could, I don't know if you'd have extra insight into that. I My feeling is that you wouldn't be allowed to because it's an online program to get that visa, yeah. but um, I'm not sure, Helen, if you know more about that than yeah. you probably know what, me. What we the advice, um, Kieran, is it's very important to actually get in touch with your local uh, British Council. Um, the British Council will actually have the latest rules and regulations regarding to um, students graduating and actually working in the UK. Um, so please do that. And, and unfortunately, as Dr. Kieran says, the University North Stafford can actually tell you about the rules and regulations of, of the, the government at the time. Um, so please do get in touch with uh, your nearest British Council regarding that. Okay, and just a question on full-time studies. I'll answer that one. Okay, if, if a person wants to actually go to the campus full-time, unfortunately, Stafford Global cannot assist you with that particular application. Um, we only assist students with the online distance learning applications. So if you're looking to study on campus, you do need to contact the university directly. Um, and there's a whole team of um, admissions missions assistance that can help you with that. Okay. Um, popular question again with regards to graduation. Um, if I cannot manage to get to the graduation, how do I get my degree certificate? So I believe, well, the degree certificates would be sent out by post. I believe that would be registered post as well. I, I would hope it would be registered post. Um, but what there would be, uh, you would graduate what we'd call in, in absentia. So Latin for in, in the absence of you actually being there, uh, you would be graduated. Your name would still, uh, I think your name would still be called out or it would still be marked out anyway as having graduated. Your certificate would then be posted out to you as well. 
Okay, fantastic. And um, regarding the fees, uh, please do get in touch with us at Stafford. Uh, we will be able to advise you on the fees. Uh, we do have flexible monthly payment instalments. Um, so do get in touch with us so that we can actually guide you as to the methods of payment as well. Okay, so I have managed to actually group all these questions together, very, very similar. And uh, as Dr. Kiran says, we are currently open for the May intake. The application deadline is the 20th of May. Now that is the final application deadline. However, because of the prestige of this program and also the limited space available, I do encourage you to try and send out these documents as soon as possible so that we can get that very, very important unconditional offer for you and start your program on the 30th of May. Thank you so much again uh, for joining us, Dr. Kiran. It was wonderful having you with us. And thank you to everyone that was here with us this evening. Fantastic questions. And I do hope to see you all um, on this program in May. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening.